Humans have accidentally or on purpose destroyed so much of our own history. Sometimes this is due to war, sometimes it is due to misunderstandings, and sometimes it is due to downright reckless and stupid behavior. And at other times, we just simply want to be right about something so badly that we tend to see things that are not there, and when this happens, it can get pretty embarrassing. So today, my friends, on the history of everything, we're going to be diving into the history of bad archaeology, with five examples of just how bad humans can really be. Also, before we go and continue any further, I'm going to ask that you like, comment, and subscribe, and simultaneously, I have to pitch my own thing here because the video itself is not sponsored. But my friends, if you'd hear me out for just a second, my wife and I are going to be leading a trip to Peru this next July, from July 18th through the 25th, and we're going to be seeing a variety of different things there. We're going to be hiking Machu Picchu, we're going to be going to see Rainbow Mountain, we're going to be tasting the local food of Peru, it's going to be a wonderful experience. At the time that I'm making this, there are only a couple of the early bird spots left that actually get a discount. And remember, you only have to put 25% down when you sign up, so by all means, click the link down in the description and join us on this adventure. And if Peru is not necessarily up to your speed, there are only nine spots left in our trip to Italy. So if you want to see ancient Rome and Florence and all the monuments, of that, then again, I'm going to be leaving a link down in the description. Thank you, my friends, and back to the video. Now, my friends, there's no way that we could go and start this list without talking about the first thing that is on here, Heinrich Schliemann, which if you don't know who that is, buckle up because, oh my God, is this a crazy ride? Because this guy, Johann Ludwig Heinrich Julius Schliemann, he was a German archaeologist, or I say archaeologist, the bigger thing was that he was a businessman and was actually the discoverer of Troy. And yes, when I say that, I am 100% serious. I am talking about the legendary city of Troy, the one from Homer and the Iliad, and the legendary Greek battle that has reverberated throughout all of history, that city, that Troy, it is in fact real. And this guy is responsible for having found it, or at least sort of, the, the actual story is, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. You see, although he was untrained in archaeological techniques, he was more of really a treasure hunter than a scientist, he was extremely enthusiastic about things, and his determination would lead him to find many, many significant significant finds. In fact, he would do so much during this time period that his work would inspire many other trained archaeologists to actually continue the search for people and places that were only recorded down in myths and legends, things before that had been previously dismissed, but now he was bringing new recognition to the lives of those who formed the early history of humankind, even as he went and destroyed these sites. Yeah, this is going to sound really weird here right now, but uh, it's not very often that we come across a archaeologist who is more commonly associated with destruction than actually actual discovery of knowledge, but um, that's this guy. Now, that all being said, Schliemann was still widely regarded as an archaeology pioneer in this time, as this was, of course, at a point where scientific archaeology was still in its more infant stages. But considering the techniques that he was using at the time, he would still receive ample criticism throughout his entire life, and even more would come out after his death. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Schliemann absolutely believed that the places that were mentioned in the works of Homer were real places. And he was wasn't the only one. There had already been some isolated discoveries in the region in Turkey where people thought that Troy probably was, even if for centuries prior, the majority of people had dismissed it as a myth. But when Schliemann had started excavating in Turkey, the site that was widely deemed to be Troy, where it actually was, was located at something called Pinarbazi, which was a hilltop at the south end of what was called the Trojan Plain. And it was Frank Calvert, an English expatriate, who was already the specialist or local expert at the time when Schliemann would arrive, as Calvert had already spent many years digging in this location, finding a number of different artifacts, but the unfortunate reality is that he ran out of money and did not have the ability to pursue his actual dig that he wanted to do. Schliemann, on the other hand, oh, oh, he was rich. This was a loaded man. And so while Calvert had spent years at excavation at this location, he became convinced that the true site of Troy was not there, but actually at another site, something called Hisserlich. And in order to be able to dig there, since he was out of money, he was going to need Schliemann to sponsor this next dig. At this point, they would enter into things as business partners, though, to be fair, Schliemann would effectively take over everything at this point. And so what Schliemann would do is he would carry out the excavations of nine levels of archaeological remains at Hisserlich. That's right, as one dug deeper, there were nine different layers to this site from all varying different time periods throughout history. And convinced that Troy, being the ancient city that it was, was probably at the bottom, uh, Schliemann proceeded to dig basically straight down in a trench and simultaneously use dynamite 
right. No, I'm not kidding. This man was straight up using mass explosives in order to be able to dig at a precious archaeological site. And due to that, he has been widely criticized by the historians and archaeologists who consider his actions to have wiped away significant historical artifacts because, yeah, he, he kind of did that. And so despite the fact that he was basically destroying every single thing he came across, the fact remains that the names that he gave the sites that he was discovering while simultaneously blowing up, well, those names would end up still sticking. Like you would still have the consolidated layers of Troy 1 through 5, 6, 7, 7 through 9, etc. It was just, these things would stick and they were all named Troy. But now that all being said, some other archaeological surveys that followed would unravel the level that Schliemann would name as the ancient Troy as being, well, inaccurate. In an article that was published in the Classical World, D.G. Easton would criticize Schliemann as someone who lacked the capacity to distinguish fact from hearsay and interpretation, which is definitely something that is true. Another article that was published by the National Geographic Society would also question Schliemann's qualifications, his motives, as well as, of course, the methods that he used. Quote, In northwestern Turkey, Heinrich Schliemann excavated the site to be Troy in 1870. Schliemann was a German adventurer and con man who took sole credit for the discovery, even though he was digging at the site, called Hisserlich, at the behest of British archaeologist Frank Calvert. Eager to find the legendary treasures of Troy, Schliemann blasted his way down to the second city, where he found what he believed were the jewels that once belonged to Helen. As it turns out, the jewels were a thousand years older than the time described in Homer's epic. So yeah, uh, all that is information that would come out later, but he straight up blasted down a thousand years later than he actually planned. And even if you want to take the whole jewelry thing as a coincidence, the pottery in and of itself speaks volumes. Because the pottery that they were finding in Troy 2 was deemed to be way too old to actually belong to the time period that we're talking about, because that was in Troy 2. In Troy 6, that was much higher, they were finding Mycenaean pottery, meaning that the previous pottery was many hundreds of years too old to actually belong to the time period that we're talking about. Yeah, a lot of Schliemann's findings during this time were later judged to be false by archaeologists who did some proper research and work going into it. But if that wasn't bad enough, that was only describing what they judged to be false. It's not even counting all of the varying artifacts and sites and regions of it that he completely destroyed of the actual real level of Troy trying to dig down to what he thought was Troy. Still, all that being said, even as Schliemann's work as an archaeologist has been broadly denounced, simultaneously he is still attributed as being one of the grand pioneers who really galvanized this branch of study in the world. Thanks to his books, as well as his contributions to many different papers and scientific journals during this time, time period, he would keep society informed and excited about everything that he was doing with archaeology. He was like really one of the first people to go in here and pioneer the use of what you could call social media to be able to expose the public to the excitement of what it was that he was doing. This was something that no one else at this point had really ever done, and in doing so, he was galvanizing other people to get into archaeology, most of whom would be significant significantly more careful and better prepared than he was. But honestly, I could do a full episode on this guy. If you want to hear his story as well as the full story of the discovery of Troy, then you need to check out the podcast episode that I did, which I'm going to leave a link for down in the description. You should definitely check that out because, oh my God, I did not even explain half of the crap that he got up to. Well, moving on, if the previous thing that we talked about was deliberate destruction, then this, my friends, is deliberate misinterpretation. We are talking about the story of the Runema runes. Now, I'm going to need to kind of explain this, but before the invention of paper, humanity would often inscribe words and symbols and images onto stone as well as the surrounding landscape, pretty much whatever they could inscribe some kind of marking onto. And these images, often commemorating significant cultural events or telling ancient stories or simply jokes in the case of some cases of graffiti, these are oftentimes studied by modern scholars to piece together narratives of various different ancient cultures that we don't really have a lot of information about. And, as is the case with all scholars, However, there are those who have a tendency to get carried away in the moment and allow their fanciful imaginations to dictate their studies. And the Runema runes carved into the Runema rock in Sweden, these are perhaps one of the greatest examples that you could have of such a costly mistake. So, okay, the question that someone is probably going to have in the circumstance of what exactly are the Runema runes? What, what, what are these things? 
Well, these are supposed runes that going back centuries, almost a thousand years, people have been wondering what exactly they are. Well, as an example of how old the things I'm talking about here are, Saxo Grammaticus is regarded as one of the earliest historians of Denmark. He was a 12th to 13th century scholar, and he was supposedly, at least from what we have been able to find, the first person to note down these runes that were inscribed on a cliff face in southern Sweden in his book, The Gesta Denorum. And initially, when he was writing about all this, he described the runes as illegible, stating that the men sent by King Valdemar to inspect the site could not make out any words. But then later, he would attribute the carving to the runes of King Harald Hiddleton of Denmark, also known as Harald Wartooth, and his father, Holker Ringslinger, according to history and legend, had waged a successful war to unite Sweden and Denmark. And so according to Grammaticus, the inscription was a memorial to the great deeds of Hiddleton's father. Except there was really nothing and no information that he had going off of this. He just said that that was the case. So now over time, the Runamar runes effectively faded from people's heads, at least for the next five centuries, as no one could really figure them out or there really was no point in any of it after Grammaticus published this in his book. But then in the 17th century, there was a Danish antiquarian by the name of Ole Worm, or Ole Worm? Ole Worm? 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 His name is Worm, and I think that's all that needs to be said. Anyway, he sends his assistant to Sweden to go and examine the rock, and his assistant would go back and report to Worm that he wasn't really able to make out any of it, that all of it was illegible except for one word that he was able to decipher, that being the word Lund, which translates to grove, and when he would take that back to Worm, Worm would then publish this in all of his findings along with a bunch of different illustrations. And I gotta say, these illustrations about the entire thing are hilarious because later expeditions over the course of the 18th century would find absolutely no more than the assistant to the previous guy did, but they would continue to create more and more illustrations about all this academic knowledge that they were going to be able to acquire, and every single time someone would go and make a new illustration, it would just get more and more precise of what it was that's like, yes, we know, we know exactly what everything is saying, when they didn't. And the word Lund would then appear unquestioningly on every single report that every person made and every single time again they said it it would just become more fanciful and more clear that yes this is very clearly a message but at the same time that this was happening other scholars were taking a look at the situation going um really such as as an example you can see the guy behind me here nils reinhold brockman and this guy in one of his books in Saga, would go and question grammaticus's contradictory conclusions simultaneously he would write to a friend asserting that he had been to the runama rocks and he didn't find anything there except naturally occurring cracks in the stone. And this debate between scholars would go on for many, many years, with no one really having any kind of conclusive evidence that would say otherwise, as they would just argue with one another over the possible meaning or lack of meaning of these runes. And so if we go and fast forward a bit of time, apparently in the 19th century, the full meaning of the runes was supposedly revealed. In 1833, the Danish Academy of Sciences would go and send a commission to investigate the Runema runes, and this was composed of the antiquarian philologist Finner Magensen, historian Christian Molbeck, and geologist Johann Georg Falkenhammer. And the reason why they sent these guys as a team is because Forkhammer was specifically tasked with examining the markings and then highlighting those that he believed to be man-made, all without Magnuson's involvement in order to ensure that there wasn't going to be any kind of tainting of the scientific process. And then after this was finished, the highlighted runes, as they were deemed to be runes, would be transferred to copper plates and then given to Magnuson, who would take them home for analysis. And after a whole lot of investigating, you know what Magnuson found? Nothing. He, he found absolutely nothing. He couldn't really figure out anything about what these runes could possibly mean until he decided to do something that was rather unorthodox. Because suddenly, what he decided to do was instead of reading things from the standard left to right, he was going to take a page out of the ancient book of some of the Icelandic sagas and instead read from right to left. And after doing so, he thought that he had finally found the meaning, saying that the entire thing spelled out an ancient ode to King Hildeson and the Battle of Bravala. Now, of course, if all this was real, this was going to be a huge thing for Scandinavian history. But almost immediately, as soon as he published this, these assertions were immediately rejected by natural scientists. These other natural scientists and historians were very quick to go and study the runes and Magnuson's reports in depth, and then from this, 
refute them through geological investigation, including the use of plaster in order to try and go make casts of the cracks. The debate around the ruins would go on for years, with books, with articles, with letters, with all of this emerging, with people arguing with each other for years, getting vicious about their own beliefs about what the runes represented, and whether or not the whole thing was real. Only for, in the end, ultimately it was concluded that the runes were actually nothing more than natural cracks in the stone formed by ancient volcanic activity, that they were able to determine this through chemical and geological studies. The whole thing was very embarrassing. Now, interestingly enough, in the aftermath of all this, Magnuson as well as Forkhammer were both respected academics, and they would remain so after all this happened, just to a little bit of a lesser degree. They were criticized for giving into their imagination and a desperate desire to have some sweeping massive discovery that was going to change Scandinavian history, as many people were eager to do over the course of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. But for the most part, they were still pretty well regarded within the scientific community, even if other people at times would reference them and make fun of them. Again, the whole thing was rather embarrassing. Anyway, moving on, if before we were talking about something that was a misunderstanding, how about something that was a deliberate and outright lie? This is the Holyoke Pendant. So here's the story as this goes. In 1889, you have an individual that is named Hilborn T. Cresson, and he's an archaeological assistant at Harvard's Peabody Museum. And he goes and announces that he has discovered a prehistoric seashell pendant that bore an engraving of a woolly mammoth. And he says that he found it in a peat and forest lair near the Holyoke Railway Station in North in Delaware, hence the name, the Holly Oak Pendant. Now, the pendant that we're talking about here in this situation is a very important find, as it suggests that prehistoric man in America must have been there at a time when woolly mammoths were still roaming the continent. And for this being an item that is tens of thousands of years old, this is something that would definitely show an important information about tribal society at that time, if, if it was real. You see, my friends, a pendant or a gorget, which is the other name for this, is a sort of decorative necklace that is worn to display a person's status. And in Native American in culture, it is common for a gorget to be carved out of materials such as shells, mollusks, gourds, etc. And over time, different gorgets would commonly show a person's status within their tribe. Carvings could be related to family, uh, tribal symbols, mythology, quite literally anything. And because gorgets would hold such great information about the tribe or the owner who would wear it, they are extremely important archaeological finds when they are found. As again, it can tell us many things about who wore the gorget where it was carved, and the ancient community around the owner. But almost immediately, this thing was suspected of being fake. And why, you may wonder. Well, one of the reasons for suspicion was the rather unusual circumstance in which this item was found. Because Crescent, even though I don't actually have a picture of him, that was something that I wasn't able to actually find, even though he went and claimed that he had discovered this in the year 1864, this being back when he was a teenager and also in the company of his music teacher, an individual by the name of Mr. Seralt, he never brought it forward. Like, he offered no explanation as to why, over the course of 25 years, that he did not share this discovery that he supposedly found back in 1864 that would have been a very big deal at the time. And so you may go, oh, okay, well, hold on. He was just a kid, right? It's not going to be a problem. Like, he wouldn't necessarily know. Maybe he thought it was just something cool and held on to until he was older and wiser. Yeah, no. Remember that whole music teacher that he was with the entire time? That teacher was also a student of archaeology and would have understood that this was a big find. Another reason as to why people heavily doubted that this whole thing was real was because the carving on the pendant bore a very, very strong resemblance to the thing that you can see behind me here, which is not the same carving. That is a completely different one called La Madeleine, which was another engraving of a mammoth that was found at La Madeleine, France, something that was found by a Edward Lartet, an individual with whom the music teacher that we talked about before, Mr. Seralt, had actually studied with. Hmm, how convincing. You see, the La Madeline carving that we're talking about here had established that humans and mammoths did once live together in Europe. And so it seemed that whoever had actually carved the holly oak pendant had just went and copied the La Madeline engraving. Again, I don't even have any pictures of all this, but the doubts would only grow stronger when Cressa would end up getting fired from Peabody in 1891. And you may wonder, why? What could this young man, or older at that point, possibly do that could get him fired from an archaeological institute? Did he lie about something? No, it was found that he had been stealing specimens from another archaeological dig in Ohio and then turning around and selling them to private collectors. 
Hmm, that just seems like totally honest behavior now, doesn't it? Yes, my friends, things would only get worse for Crescent as over time he subsequently began to display signs of severe mental derangement. According to his obituary in the New York Times, he began to tell people that he and his son, Emlyn, were actually wanted criminals and that they had forged a number of U.S. Treasury certificates. Unfortunately, then, he would take his own life in 1894, leaving behind a note that said he was, quote, suspected of counterfeiting and that the Secret Service detective were continually on his trail, end quote. The weird thing was, over the course of all of this, is apparently there was no evidence whatsoever that he had actually gone and forged any treasury certificates, like, at all, or that he was being pursued by the detectives. Like, there, there was literally, there was nothing that was happening. These were all paranoid delusions. And that was pretty much it. Everyone at the time pretty much dismissed the whole thing as a hoax, and the pendant was largely forgotten about for many years. That being until actually fairly recent in history, going into the 1970s, a research article would come about that was created by John Kraft and Ronald Thomas, who found the holly oak pendant inside of a drawer in the Smithsonian, and they decided, hey, we're gonna go and re-examine this thing. And they concluded from that study that, hey, hey, this might actually be a genuine article. Or artifact, yeah, artifact, that's that's the right word. And so, okay, talk about an emotional roller coaster at this point, is the whole reason why Hilborn even went crazy in the first place, because so many people doubted him, that his paranoia led him to have all these delusions? Was this some kind of massive archaeological conspiracy? Well, in the article that we're talking about here, the one that you can see behind me here, Kraft and Thomas would note that they couldn't actually find any obvious signs that the pendant had been forged. As an example of this, the carving on the shell supposedly showed just as much weathering as the actual shell itself, implying that they had been done roughly around the same time. And so from all that, they went and suggested that the pendant could date from the early to middle Holocene period, which is from 8,000 BC to 4,000 BC, and that it was actually a genuine artifact. This was such a big deal and a big find for them at the time that an image, like an illustration of the artifact was actually placed on the front page of the science publication. So it's settled, right? Well, no. A lot of the people within the archaeological community remained unconvinced. And in 1988, the individual that you can see behind me here, David Meltzer of Southern Methodist University, would go and subject the pendant to radiocarbon analysis. And he concluded from this test that the shell itself was only as old as around 885 AD, which is way, way too late for the time period that we're talking about here for woolly mammoths to have appeared. Now, it's not just the radiocarbon analysis. Meltzer would also simultaneously note that there were other reasons for doubting the authenticity of the pendant. As an example, it's rather unusual that from what you can see behind me here with the holes of where things are marked, that the entire pendant would appear sideways. Because when the pendant was being worn, that meant that the mammoth would be pointing downwards. And what, what, why would it do that? Normally, they would want it to be upright so that it's in a proper position on the chest to be seen. And simultaneously, considering that the entire thing was carved onto a shell, it is very unlikely that such a shell could have lasted 10,000 years in peat, where it would have been more acidic and from that broken down. So yeah, that whole thing was a little bit of a wild one. But today, the consensus regarding the pendant is that the entire thing was a fake that was created by Crescent in an effort to just get attention and fame and glory, which is honestly rather innocent. But the next one that we're going to be talking about is a straight up scam. The Tiara of Cytophernes. Now, I'm just going to say this right now, but this whole thing is an amazing dumb event in history. Probably I could have created an entire short video that was dedicated to just this thing itself. So I'm going to do my best to kind of try and explain this. But debate over the authenticity of this massive gold crown, something that is known as the Tiara of Cytophernes. This is something that would end up dividing the city of Paris in France back in 1896. And so apparently, according to the description that you can see on the tiara here behind me, this whole thing was a gift from Olbia. Which, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, Olbia, you can see right up here, listed at the top. This was one of the many Greek colonies that were located around the Mediterranean going back several thousand years. And this was one of the ones that the Greeks had established on the Black Sea coast, and it was apparently a gift to the 3rd century Scythian king of Cytophernes. But anyway, the story of what we have of this thing comes from a Russian art dealer by the name of Shopshul Hawkman, and his tale was that this thing, this crown, was actually found at Olbia. 
The inscription that was on it even matched an ancient one that had already been published. So to a number of people that were looking at this thing, it's like, wow, this is a genuine, amazing artifact. But the new owner of it that ended up purchasing it, the Louvre in France, well, they um, they very clearly did not do their research before going in and buying the damn thing. And let me explain what it is I mean, because the context of this is kind of hilarious and it makes sense. It really does. You see, my friends, by the end of the 19th century, Greek and Scythian artwork from Russia was highly coveted, and this being as a result of many different magnificent finds from varying areas around the region. And so with European museums and collectors that were hungry to acquire anything from this region, well, of course, the stage at that point is set for a remarkable scam to be able to occur. In the year 1895, there was a Vienna newspaper that would run a brief note about Crimean peasants making an extraordinary discovery, but also from this possibly fleeing Russia out of fear that the government would end up confiscating their find. Perhaps all of this was something that was actually planted into the newspaper by Hockman in the first place, because you also have to remember that going into the 19th century, this is the time where you could pretty much buy an article and just put it into whatever newspaper you wanted, even if the entire thing was false. But either way, even if he didn't, what Hockman would then do is exhibit some of these newly recovered Russian artifacts in Vienna in February of 1896. One of which included the tiara. And being around seven inches in height and weighing a little more than a pound of solid gold, this thing looked absolutely amazing. It would depict varying scenes of Scythian daily life. It would have scenes of the Iliad, including Agamemnon and Achilles quarreling over Brissies. There was all kinds of work that was put into this that it looked fantastic. But was it real? Well, to the Imperial Court Museum at Vienna, as well as the British Museum, they didn't necessarily think so. And so they ended up passing on the tiara, but the Louvre in France, oh no, they jumped at the chance. Purchasing it for a grand total of 200,000 francs on April 1st, which I have to say here from the very beginning, looking at this, guys, I'm not saying that as a joke. No, April Fools, I understand. Do you have any idea how ironic it is that on April Fools Day that a museum would pay 200,000 francs for this? And so you're probably wondering at this point, Stack, oh, wait, how much is that? I don't, I, I don't get how significant that is. Check this out. Considering how much European coinage has changed over the years, it's next to impossible for me to find the exact worth of what something would be. But in the year 1865, if we're doing the math on this, one franc was worth approximately this many ounces of gold. 0. 0.01024, yada, yada, yada. You, you get what it is that I mean, all right? This was what one franc was worth in gold. And when I looked this up yesterday on October 17th, 2023, the price of gold as it stood at that time in the United States was $1,922.60 per ounce of gold, meaning that one franc was technically worth around $19.60 something cents. Multiply that by 200,000 of those suckers and you got a grand total of almost $4 million. If there was anyone in the comment section that could tell me right now as to whether or not I am doing that math correctly or not, please, please do let me know. But my God, if what if what I figured out here is true, then that means that the Louvre spent $4 million on this thing. And almost immediately, people were questioning whether or not it was real. So, okay, get this, right? You have a Professor Veselovsky of St. Petersburg, as well as an individual by the name of Adolf Furtwängler, which the name in and of itself is just hilarious because it looks like fart. But that's childish, I know, I know. I know, it's, it's, it's fine. Both of these guys go and condemn the entire thing as a scam in print in 1896. But the Louvre, of course, no, 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 they didn't budge. They didn't spend just $4 million on this artifact just for some stupid German and Russian to declare the whole thing is fake. Which, if the way that I'm phrasing things right there sounds a little bit odd, no, I am 100% serious about that. Because the professor in question that was questioning the prestigious French Louvre Museum was a German, the French declared that his motives were dictated by nothing more than spite. And so with the museum not willing to let people declare that its brand new priceless artifact was actually a fake, this would then spawn a six-year battle between the Louvre as well as the Parisian press who would continuously question it and go after it. But why then did people think that this thing was a fake? Well, the crown's amazing state of preservation was one of the key clues. The only damage in it was in the non-essential areas. Ironically, while this should have been a tip-off for the Louvre, it was actually a hook for the museum, which took pride in the fact that the tiara was in an almost perfect state, something that, when it comes to ancient artifacts, is not really a common thing. Arguments would go back and forth until Henry Roquefort, the editor of the newspaper La Intransiente, would finally convince the Louvre that, like, hey, we need to go and perform a thorough investigation of this thing. Fast forward a little bit of time, and in the year 1903, the newspaper by the name of Le Matin 
would publish a letter by a Russian jeweler called Lifshitz, who said that he actually witnessed a friend named Israel Rokomovsky making the tiara in the first place. The artist, who was from a small town near Odessa, would be brought to Paris, and when questioned by the Louvre, he would claim that Hawkman had actually tricked him. He would say that Hawkman had asked him to make the tiara not as anything to imitate an artifact, but actually to make it as a gift for an archaeologist friend, and had given him books showing Greco-Scythian artifacts from which he could then base his work on. Rukomovsky would then point out the exact books to the investigators that he had used, and described how he made it in three parts and that he had actually soldered it together. Naturally speaking, the Louvre did not want to believe him and asked him to prove his skills and he was given a sheet of gold and told that he needed to prove it before they accepted his story, which, um... He, he then subsequently did. He then proved how he was able to make all of it in front of them. Because of their immense desire to acquire what they thought was a priceless artifact, the Louvre had missed any of the warning signs that were in front of them that could have saved them from massive embarrassment. They thought that the tiara was perfect, and that was kind of part of the problem. Like, the tiara was flawed. There were signs of modern tool usage, but these were carefully concealed, and you would actually have to do a thorough investigation in order to find them in the first place. Place. But the biggest hint about all of it, the entire thing, was the preservation of it, which was then subsequently mocked in a World Today article in the year 1907. Quote, There were a lot of indentations on the tiara, and these furnish a comical note in this affair. They were supposedly to have been caused by the falling of stones of the tomb, and these stones certainly possessed a rare and discriminating appreciation of art, since they had avoided falling on any of the numerous figures of the relief, but had dented in most of the spooth spaces. What was more... Unless the worthy Scythian potnate had turned around a few times in his tomb, one could not explain why dents were found on all sides of the tiara. However, there had been no miracle. The bumps and indentations were made by using alternatively the ends of a common ball pain hammer. So yeah, if you're not catching what it is that I am talking about there, the really funny detail about all of this is that all of the figures that you can see in here of the fancy artwork, not a single one of those figures were damaged by any of the falling stones that dented the artifact in the first place. Only the flat areas where there was no artwork or anything depicted on it. And if there had been a person that was laying down in their tomb when things fell on them, theoretically, the stone should have only damaged damaged the front and part of the sides, it should not have gone all the way around the complete helmet or the crown. I mean, it should not have gone all the way to the crown. You know what it is that I mean. And so, yeah, the entire thing was revealed to be a scam. And you may wonder at this point, well, what did the Louvre do with such an artifact then? What did they end up doing afterwards? Well, they still own it. But even though they do own it, simultaneously, they're not actually putting it out on display, though they did do this at one point. Fast forward a good 60 years and the whole thing had kind of calmed down and the Louvre decided to accept being the butt of the joke and create its own exhibit called the Salon of Fakes, in which they would go and exhibit a bunch of fake or imitation artwork, one of which was the crown, and they would do this in the year 1954. Weirdly enough, the time that all this happened, it would also appear along eight fake Mona Lisas. Just a little funny detail. But while what we just talked about was definitely a scam, the next thing that we're going to be talking about is um, just sad and simultaneously crazy. We are going to talk about Babylon. Now, I know that for a number of you that are listening to this right now, this is going to sound very different than any of the previous things that we have talked about so far. This is Babylon, once the capital of a succession of vast ancient empires and the site of extraordinary technological and artistic innovation. Babylon is one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. It is something that is widely known for its legendary hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Babylon today is something that is home to national treasures such as the Ishtar Gate and the Lions of Babylon. But the ruins of Babylon, also known as Babel, date back over 3,000 years. The world world's first known civil code was written here. Alexander the Great went and died here, and many different Bible stories would take place within this land. It is something that really sticks with people as one of the most powerful and greatest ancient creations of humans. And that is something that many people over the years would try to hearken back to, including Saddam Hussein. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this right now, but considering the subject that we're going to be talking about here, I don't necessarily know what kind of pictures, images, or videos I'm able to display. I'm going to try and do my best here in this situation. But what we're going to be talking about are the actions of a megalomaniac, and that is something that potentially can create a big problem here on YouTube. But we'll try our best. You see, my friends, when Saddam went and invaded Iran back in the year 1980, the country at the time was still reeling from the 1979 revolution. And so when he did this, Saddam believed
believed that in only a few weeks of fighting, this was something that would solidify his position as the leader of a unified Pan-Arabist dream and allow him to effectively take over the oil-rich regions of the area. It proved to be one of the greatest political errors of his career. Within a few years, Iran had not only retaken its territory that it had lost, but simultaneously then also launched its own offensive invasions into Iraq. And by 1983, the Pan-Arabist dream that Saddam had of uniting the Arab world, well, that was something that was disappearing. The war showed no sign of ending, and the Iraqis around him did not understand why they were fighting in a conflict that they had never asked for in the first place. Saddam, of course, was the unquestioned leader of Iraq, and what he did at the time is what many leaders over the course of history have done in an effort to try and galvanize people. He turned to more nationalistic building projects, things that were designed to make the people proud of what they were and show how great and superior they were. And so Saddam Hussein went and ordered the reconstruction of Babylon, which is definitely something when you look at this, um, sounds kind of weird. I mean, after all, Babylon is not Islamic. It's not Arab. It's definitely pre-Islamic. It's just, it's, it's not something that actually fits Iraq, at least not at this point in its history. But the reason why he did this at this time was specifically to celebrate the idea of ancient Iraq as its own kind of independent culture and entity, something that was different from his pan-Arabist ideals of before. He wanted to inspire and instill pride in his people and also simultaneously celebrate himself, but we're going to be getting into that in a second. Saddam would go and siphon millions upon millions of dollars into this rebuilding project, and he pushed to have the reconstruction built on the foundations of the original site. The project was not only something that was nationalistic, but also incredibly narcissistic. And we're going to get into why, but over the course of the construction, there were very clear signs of severe megalomania. Saddam wanted every single Iraqi to know that he is the one that rebuilt Babylon. The point of all this wasn't that it was an archaeological reconstruction of the city for the sake of science and history in the past. It was an idealization of history specifically for the purpose of cementing the legitimacy of of the current regime. And I don't think there's any greater example of that than what he did at Babylon, where he had his own palace constructed there. The whole thing was carved with Arabic calligraphy that when you're first looking at it, seems like, okay, this is religious iconography. But when you go and look at it upon closer inspection, you realize that no, um, these were actually Saddam Hussein's initials plastered everywhere all over the building. There were brutalist, hyper-realist reliefs that depict him leading soldiers on the battlefield. The ceilings were painted with symbols of Iraqi civilization, ranging from Babylon lions to towers that Saddam had built in Baghdad. And when Saddam heard that Nebuchadnezzar had stamped the bricks of ancient Babylon with his name and titles, Saddam was like, yeah, yeah, you know what? No, that, that definitely needs to be done. And so he ordered that the reconstruction would have to mimic this practice. And so to this very day, there are bricks all over the course of Babylon. That it's like, I, I know a lot of you can't read this right now and what it is that it says, but I got a translation of it. And it says, and I quote, in the reign of the victorious Saddam Hussein, the president of the Republic, may God keep him the guardian of the great Iraq and renovator of its Renaissance and the builder of its great civilization, the rebuilding of the great city of Babylon was done in 1987. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it didn't exactly work out from there. You all kind of know the story of what happened with Iraq going into the early 2000s. When President Bush of the United States would order U.S. forces to invade Iraq in 2003, they would actually go and occupy Babylon and ended up turning Saddam's castle into their command center. The graffiti from those days, a mixture between the American forces and Iraqi workers, is still something that remains in the palace and other regions of Babylon. Babylon to this day. The entire thing that Saddam had built had effectively ruined what little remained of the previous ancient Babylon. And when that was done, the U.S. forces that moved in effectively destroyed what little remained after that. As from this, many precious artifacts would be taken, and the walls and other regions would be damaged by tanks running over them. Really, in the end, the entire thing is just incredibly sad. But my friends, thank you very much for watching. This has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. I ask that you like, comment, and subscribe, and please let me know in the comment section below what it is that we should cover next. I know that this was a rather interesting one to dive into, and it covered a variety of different topics. So if there's other things that you all would like to see, then by all means, let me know down in the comment section below, as I love taking your suggestions in order to be able to create things. And as I said earlier in this video, if you do want to go with me to Peru, if you want to go with me to Italy, then by all means, click the links down in the description because we still have some spots that are available on these trips and in the case of Peru there are early bird spots left that you can get a discount on. Thank you for joining me here today and I hope that you all join me in the future here for more adventures. I will see you next time. Goodbye my friends.